Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen Jurd here at the Sydney Retreat again, talking through the four sessions of the doctor's opinion. So in the last session, we talked about genetics and how there's a powerful, monumental amount of evidence that there is a genetic component to addiction. This week's session, to get all biological on you again, is called evolution. And the reason it's called evolution is because of the site, the place of down here, through here, at the very base of the brain, that's where the reward pathway is. Now, we need to think about evolution. Now, usually when I talk about evolution, I start with the pentadactyle limb. That's what we doctors call the hand, right? the feet. Five digits. So you need to think, what are the most primitive animals that have five digits? Lizards. You've seen a gecko on a wall walking up. It's got five digits, hasn't it? Five toes on its four feet. Mammals have got five digits, often cramped into a foot pad or a hoof, but they've got the same specialisation. But then you come to primates, and primates have got hands like humans. Our hands have evolved so that we've got a poseable thumb, so it can touch each of our five fingers. We can catch a ball, we can knit, we can write, we can bowl a leg spinner or an off spinner. We, we can do all manner of amazing things with our hands. They're very useful, they've evolved a lot. But they come with the basic pattern from lizards. Where are you going, Jerd? Get to the point. Okay, let's get to the point. What about the brain? Is it possible that the brain has evolved as well? Of course. Of course the brain has evolved as well. Now, if you think about it, you go back to lizards, they don't have a forehead, do they? They've got lizards, snakes, they've got really flat skulls because their brains are really flat, you know? Rats, mice, they don't have much of a bump at the front of their, at, on top of their heads, do they? They're flat because they're not real smart. If everybody, anybody's ever had a lizard as a pet, usually in these sessions I'll ask, who's, who's had a lizard or a snake or other reptile as a pet? I get reliably informed that lizards are dumb. Snakes are dumb. They don't learn tricks. They don't come when they're called. Wait on, this reward pathway is down in the lizard part of the brain. It's not the smart part of the brain. What's going on there? I'm smart, we're all smart. Probably every person in this room has sat down in a room sometime and thought, I'm the smartest person in this room because we're all very impressed with our own intelligence. That's the nature of human beings. We like to think that about ourselves. When we're confronted with alcoholism, addiction, doing the same thing over and over and over again, and coming up against the same brick wall and hitting your head ever harder on it, you come to wonder about your intelligence. What's going on here? Why do I do this? Your smart brain's in here, behind your forehead, up here under your eyes, the orbitofrontal cortex. So what's happened is the brain's evolved. So, so it's like that and there, there's your brain and, and over evolution, down here's the lizard part, on top, you get a little bit of mammal brain growing, and then you get primate growing on top of that, and then wrapped around underneath, over and up above your eyes. That's the frontal lobes. That's the really smart part of the brain, the most recently evolved. And it likes to tell us that it's in charge all the time. But the experience of an addict or an alcoholic makes it clear that that's not the case there's been a bit of a battle between the reward pathway and the frontal lobes and the reward pathways won. It has told you what's more important and the lizard, maybe the croc, has been in charge of your life. And that might begin to explain some of your behaviour. You know so well what your values are. I am a good person. 
I value being a member of society, being a legal person, being, being sensible, sharing, loving my family, loving my children, being a good worker, earning money, investing wisely, et cetera, et cetera. Tick, 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 tick. We all value those things. They're all good things, but we don't always do them. Why is that? Because we have competing desires. If you feed the lizard, it comes out. In the first of these sessions, talking about the reward pathway, we talk about how flooding artificial stimulation into that reward pathway overwhelms the receptors. What do the receptors do? They multiply. Multiple receptors, extra receptors sprout. And what does that mean? It means eventually that the normal experiences of life from which you're supposed to gain some pleasure, just drinking a glass of water on a hot day, eating a piece of fruit, seeing your children off in the distance running towards you. How great is that? How magnificent to see your children run towards you from a distance. But those little joys get crowded out when artificially intense chemicals go into that reward pathway flood the receptors, the receptors multiply so that next time they're flooded, they won't be overwhelmed. They'll catch all of the dopamine that's flying through and get the full extent of the artificial uh, stimulation. But that means that the standard physiological stimulation, the normal warm feeling when you see a friend, when you see your child across the road coming out of school, when you even think about your spouse and, and how much you love them, those little blips, they don't register. And your reward pathway tells your frontal lobes, you know what to do. You know how to get the real grunt here. Let's get the real grunt. And it goes looking for it. Okay, I lie. I said your reward pathway tells you. Actually, to help you to understand this, it's probably crucial to know that crocs don't come when they're called. You need a leash. You need to control those animals. You need four people to jump on top of them and wrap their mouth up uh, to start with and, uh, and then deal with them. They're, they're not very cooperative. They're apex predators, okay? And they don't learn tricks. If you, if you put the pressure on people who own a... Uh, uh, a reptile, they'll say, oh, they'll come for food. Yeah, that's it. That's the trick. And that's what they, if you've been up to the Daly River, you will have seen the croc come up out of the water to grab the chicken. And it's not down there thinking, oh, I think that's a chicken. Oh, perhaps if I propel myself vertically enough, I'll get it. They just do it want, like a snake striking. That's how thoughtful it is. Snake goes, food, bang. Inside a human brain, we've evolved to have all these smart parts, but we've got to deal with these powerful drives that come from deep down in the lizard brain. It's not coming out in English. It doesn't see reason. This is why the addict, the alcoholic, is talking to his lizard brain and saying, now, listen here, this time we are only going to have a couple of drinks. When you refer to, to yourself in the plural, you've got a problem. Okay, we're only going to have a couple of drinks. This time it's going to be different. This time I'm not going to mix my drinks. This time I'm not going to drink anything from the top shelf. This time, this time it's going to be different. Your lizard brain's not hearing any of that. Doesn't speak English. It just wants. It just emits drives. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Not even in those words just outrageous, grinding desire. That's where it comes from. That's why you can't be talked out of this because the part you need to talk to can't hear it, doesn't understand words. I've got a couple of medical examples of this. So I've got a couple of patients of mine who are both doctors. So you can only presume that they've got excellent frontal lobe because they got through med school and they survived as doctors and so on. So one doctor told me this story. He said that he'd become dependent on pethidine. 
Now, pethidine is an interesting drug. It's now been taken off most formularies. It, it's not used anymore because the main side effect of pethidine is that doctors got addicted to it because it's like a speedball. It's got, uh, it's got opiate and a stimulant. The, the first metabolite, the first breakdown product of the pethidine has, uh, has got stimulant properties. So it's like you're taking a, an opiate and a stimulant at the same time and it really fires you up. And it's in these little two mil vials and it's got red writing on the side. So this doctor was telling me that he'd been off the pethidine for a while and he didn't want it and he didn't like it. He, he wasn't taking care of himself properly. properly. He wasn't getting any therapy. He wasn't going to meetings. He wasn't doing the steps, but he was being good, okay? He went, he, as it turns out, he took a patient into operating theatre and, and he saw his mate, the anaesthetist over there. And he said, hey, John, good to see you. And he, and he went over to chat to John. As he went over there, he noticed a little two mil vial with the red writing on the side. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get this. His lizard told him, two mil, red writing, get. He goes over towards it, talks to the anaesthetist and sort of edges him around the corner a little bit as he talks, slaps him on the shoulder, whatever, grabs the two mil vial, palms it, sticks it in his pocket, finds a needle, finds a syringe, ducks into the change room, ducks into the toilet, locks himself in there, shoots it up. As it goes into his veins, he doesn't feel the rush of the opiate going into his body. He just starts to feel very weak. There's another drug that's in two mil vials with red writing down the side. It's called succimethonium. And euphemistically, the anaesthetists call it a muscle relaxant. That is, it's like curare, like the, uh, the poison that comes out of the Amazon that it means that you cannot move a muscle in your body, including the diaphragm. Soon after he's injected it, this guy gets the understanding that that's what he's done to himself. Luckily, he noisily, because he hasn't got any muscle tone at all, he noisily falls off the toilet and they find him and resuscitate him so he was alive to tell the story. He would have died otherwise and they resuscitated him and he went on to recover from addiction. But that's a really good example of the lizard wanting, the lizard brain wanting, and the smart human brain not even doing the thing that every doctor has to do when he injects something. Read the vial. This is pethidine. This is succimethonium. This one is for pain. This one is to paralyze people. This begins to explain why our best intentions, the best intentions of, of addicts and alcoholics overwhelmed by drives from deep down within the brain. Deep down within the brain, in that old lizard part, because we've still got it there. That's the thing about evolution. You, still, you can still make your hand look like a gecko's foot because that gecko's foot has evolved to a human hand. In the same way, there's old reptilian parts of our brain. Another one of my patients, he told a similar story. He told a story about, you know, when, when we were talking about the desire, the overwhelming desire to use, he'd just do this. He'd just, go, he'd just say, this is the croc coming up out of the water and grabbing the chicken and not thinking about it. It was very relevant for him because he was out in the bush at a festival and he was in a very remote country town and he was holding, he, he was holding the white powders, a couple of them, in his pocket, out of nowhere, sniffer dogs, sniffer dog, dogs in, you know, some small country down, who would have thought? He looks around the table, he says, it's all right, I got this. Ducks into the toilet, stands over the toilet with the drugs in his hand, about to pitch them, listening carefully. They left, good, don't have to chuck them. Went back to the table, the sniffer dog came back, they busted him, that's how he got to see me. <laughs> and got into a whole lot of other trouble with the medical board, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all that stuff. When he did that, I knew that that was the powders that he wouldn't let go of. That he just couldn't bring himself to chuck down the toilet. Because when your reward pathway fires off, it's not saying, 
I want this. It's saying, this is good. This is life essential. That's the part of the brain that helps a lizard to be motivated to eat, to be motivated to procreate, to be motivated to find shelter, to escape from a predator. It's about life and death. And in addiction, that's the part of the brain that is artificially stimulated. And the smart human brain works out, oh, it feels like this is life essential. I've got to do whatever it says. And so what happens is rather than being the slave lizard with the lead, it becomes the dragon that the human brain chases. This is why it's a very frustrating thing for somebody with addiction. It's there in the brain, but you can't talk to it and you can't change it. What can you do? What the 12 step program does is it gets you to seek other rewards, to seek the reward that you get from fellowship, hanging out together, feeling good together, having fun together and to pump that up. It seeks you, seeks for you to work those inventory steps and try to get your frontal lobes to focus firmly on becoming a better person. So it's like your frontal lobes doing push-ups, all the while not feeding the lizard. You keep the lizard in its place, you abstain completely from alcohol and other drugs, and you use those affiliative parts of the brain that, that mammals have got. We're mammals too. You know how much dogs love lying on one another, love lying on you, just love being together. They do all of that. And that happens with our fellowship. So that's the mammalian parts of our brain that fire off. And then working with the higher parts of our brain, we work in the frontal lobes, we say, what sort of a person do I want to be? What are my values? What are my true values? And you pump them up. This is the way of recovery. And that's the session that we'll do next week. We'll talk about recovery. Thank you.